video is looking at changes in state and specific latent heat. So we'll look at some calculations for that as well at the end of the video. Uh, but first, we want to explain what happens when something changes state. When we talk about the states of matter, we typically think about solids, liquids, and gases. There are, in fact, more states of matter than that, um, as we'll talk about in a minute. There's also plasma. Uh, but the main ones for GCSE that you must know are solid, liquid, and gas. So when we move from a solid to a liquid, we obviously know that process is melting. So an example would be ice melting before water. Uh, obviously, if we go the other way, that would be freezing. When we go to a gas, that is boiling. Now, um, evaporation also does that, but evaporation is a slightly different process because evaporation can happen below a boiling point. So, like the water in the sea evaporates to form clouds, but it doesn't boil. Um, so, boiling is, is really what happens at the temperature where you really don't have a choice anymore. You have to go from a liquid to a gas. So, make sure you say boiling for that. And then the opposite of boiling is condensing or condensation. Um, we can also skip out the liquid phase altogether, and there is a name for a process to go straight from a solid to a gas. This happens with dry ice, or also with iodine, uh, and this is called sublimation. And that is when you just miss out the liquid state altogether. So if I heat up solid iodine, which is a grey solid, it turns straight into a purple vapour um, as a gas. The opposite of that is deposition. Just as an extra point, if I keep heating up a gas, you can then increase the kinetic energy so much that even the electrons don't stay attached, and we then have a plasma. And because the electrons are no longer attached, that's called ionization. And obviously, reattaching electrons is called recombination. Lastly, it's important that you understand that as you move up here, there is increased internal energy uh, in these different states of matter. So first of all, let's just think about the nature of change. Okay. Um, so um, if you think about obviously these processes going from a solid to a liquid to a gas, or from a gas to a liquid to a solid, the difference is about which way is the energy going. So when we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, when we melt and then boil, we are adding thermal heat energy. And when we go the opposite way, energy is being removed. So when we talk about changes of state, it's really important we understand which bond we're talking about. So there are two types of bonds to be aware of, right? Inter and intra molecular forces. Intra means within, so it's the forces within a molecule, whereas inter molecular forces are between molecules. It's these ones represented here by these yellow lines, uh, the dash lines. So those are the forces between molecules. And those are the ones that have to break or form when we change state. In tramolecular forces, these only change and break when chemical reactions happen. So those are ionic covalent metallic bonds. In this case, these are covalent. Uh, but they only break during a chemical reaction. Whereas these bonds here, the intermolecular bonds, change during a, uh, a change of state. So when something reaches a temperature when it can melt, uh, obviously that is the melting point uh, and in terms of how that is similar or different to the freezing point they're the same temperature the difference is what's happening to the energy so at the melting point um, the temperature uh, of the material stops increasing um, and because their energy then is being used to overcome the intermolecular forces and sort of rearrange the molecules the freezing point is the same at this point the energy is being um, released uh, because the energy is no longer required to hold those molecules uh, in, in place. Um, so internal energy is the kinetic energy of particles and the potential energy. Potential energy is how much energy the particles have because of how they're spread, spread out. So an example of that would be like in elastic band. If I've just got a regular elastic band just sort of like that, it doesn't have any much energy. However, I stretch my elastic band by applying a force to it, then it has a lot more energy. So how spread out are the molecules? So if the temperature of a system rises, molecules travel more rapidly. Their kinetic energy is the thing that's increasing and therefore increasing inter uh, internal energy. Increasing the temperature doesn't affect the 
potential energy because that's only to do with the spacing of the molecules. The potential energy is linked to the spacing of molecules. The more spread out they are, the greater the potential energy. So before we focus on changes of state, we just need, I want to compare them to chemical changes. So we have two types of changes, physical change and chemical change. Physical change, no new substances are made, but there is a change in the appearance. So that is, for example, a change of state. Also, dissolving is an example of that. So really all we're doing we're reorganizing the molecules we already have. In a chemical change, this is different because the molecules themselves now change. So bonds are chemical bonds are broken and new chemical bonds are formed. It has a change of appearance and a detectable energy change. So light or heat might be given out like fire um, and you form new substances. Okay. Now, in terms of another difference between these, the physical things like a change of state, I can melt ice to water and then freeze water back into ice. So physical changes are reversible, whereas chemical changes are irreversible, or at least they're not very easily reversed. Um, so there's a big difference there in terms of how easily they can be reversed. So here are some examples, right? And the video at this point, have a little think about which of these are chemical and which of them are physical changes before I show you the answers. Okay, so we have an ice cream melting, so that is a physical change, it's a change of state. Here we have protein molecules in the egg um, changing shape, that is a chemical change because you can't, can't turn the cooked egg back into the raw egg. Uh, physical change, um, obviously cooked in a piece of wood. Fireworks, chemical reaction. Rusting, another chemical reaction. Sugar dissolving, that's a physical change. Combustion, chemical. And lastly, ice melting, physical. So let's have a little bit more of a look then at changes of state. So this is a heating curve. So it shows what happens to the temperature when we heat a solid uh, and then we change the state to liquid. Now you can see what happens to the graph at this point. The graph becomes flat it plateaus at this stage when we get a change in state so you recognize the change in state because of the plateaus because of these regions and so if we're going this way up a heating curve we'd be melting and then boiling if i came back down at a cooling curve it would be condensing and freezing so what's happening here well during these parts of the graph the temperature of the material is increasing so heat energy is being transferred to the particles, and those particles are gaining kinetic energy. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles. So if we transfer more heat to them, the kinetic energy increases, the temperature increases. This part of the graph here is linked to specific heat capacity. How much energy is required to heat up one kilogram of the solid by one degree C, which will be the focus of our next video. But what we want to focus on is this bit, the energy associated with a change in state. So what's happening here? Well, at this point, the temperature isn't increasing because it's changing state and therefore the heat energy isn't increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. Instead, it's increasing the potential energy. It's being used to break the bond between molecules, specifically the intermolecular bonds okay so it's breaking the intermolecular forces or intermolecular bonds between the molecules so you can see the solid going from an ordered fixed shape fixed volume arrangement lattice to a liquid a randomly arranged um, fixed volume but not fixed shape liquid because the energy has been put in to overcome those intermolecular for forces so therefore it can move around more and if you do that again here you're putting more energy in to overcome those intermolecular forces so that now the molecules can physically move away from each other and hence you end up with this arrangement of a gas. So if you're going in the reverse direction, you're condensing, energy is released um, because that energy, that potential energy is now going somewhere. So this way is um, bond breaking, this way is bond forming. So Moving on then to specifically to specific latent heat, um, like let's have a look at the equation for that. 
So we've already talked about some of the keywords for this topic. So those are just a summary of the keywords. So we're now going to focus on this one. So any maths question, first of all, remember the four steps. So any maths question in your exam, start by writing down what the question tells you um, and underlining all the key parts of the question. Then you need to choose the correct equation. Now that's going to be really easy for this calculation because there is only one equation for specific latent heat. The moment you see it talking about specific latent heat, you know what equation to pick. And the same for specific heat capacity. Then you rearrange the formula if necessary and put the numbers in. And then lastly, put your answer. Don't forget the units. So specific latent heat, what do we mean by that? So specific means divided by mass. Latent means hidden. So the reason it's hidden is that on the graph that we've just seen, where we get the flat part, there is still heat energy being transferred, but the temperature isn't increasing. So they used to describe that as hidden energy, like where is it going? And obviously we've just said it's used to break or form the intermolecular bond in heat, the thermal energy. So this is our equation, right? Which we often write as energy is mass times latent heat. So energy is measured in joules, mass is measured in kilograms, latent heat is joules per kilogram. So you can see here the, the equation rearranged in two different ways. So specific latent heat is energy divided by mass, hence why the units are joules per kilogram, and mass is energy divided by latent heat. So we've got our three versions of the equation there. Here are our definitions. So there are two types of latent heat. There is specific latent heat fusion, which is the amount of energy required to melt or freeze one kilogram of substance without changing its temperature. Specific latent heat of vaporization is the amount of energy required to boil or condense one kilogram of material without changing its temperature. So the difference between vaporization and fusion is what state change is occurring. So obviously it takes more energy to boil water than it does to melt ice. And that's why these two things have to be different. So water will have a latent heat of fusion and it will have a separate latent heat of vaporization. So let's have a look at some questions then. So here is a simple question with specific latent heat. The specific latent heat of water, so this is for melting, so that specific latent heat of fusion, is 3,334,000 joules. The question is how much energy is needed to melt an ice cube of 7 grams at 0 degrees C. So it's just telling us the temperature isn't changing. So step number one, as I've already done, underline the key parts of the question. And then write those down. So we're being asked to calculate the energy, so energy put question mark. Mass is 7 grams and latent heat is 333,000 joules per kilogram. So it's important to remember mass has to be in kilograms. So I have to make sure I convert it. So there are 1,000 grams in a kilogram, so I divide that by 1,000. I then put my numbers into my equation. If I write my equation, that's step number two, mass times latent heat. So mass is 0 0.007 kilograms times 334,000, which gives us an energy of 2,338 joules. If I look at a slightly trickier question, specific latent heat for boiling, for obviously that's for fusion, is 2,260,000 joules per Kelvin. 2,825 joules of energy are used to boil a pan of water completely dry at 100 degrees. Now the question is, what is the mass of the water pan? So we do the same thing. We underline the key parts of the question and we write down the key bits of information. So we then write the equation. The extra step now is you have to rearrange it. So remember, if I want to work out mass, I need to get it on its own. So this is mass times latent heat, so I do the opposite, so I'm going to do energy divided by latent heat, which gives me this equation. So energy divided by latent heat gives me my mass, which is 1.25 kilograms. And there, the key information is aligned. One more example. 
Your block of ice breaks away from the glacier and falls into the sea to form an iceberg. How much energy is required to melt the iceberg with a volume of 254 meters cubed and the density of water is 1,000? This question is harder because it links to another equation from P1, the equation for density. So you start by underlining the key information and you write down what you've been told in the question as you go. So when I get to this point, the reason I have to do this is I know I need to calculate energy. I have to write an equation that has energy in it. Remember, there's only one equation for latent heat. The moment I get that, I know I'm going to have to write my latent heat equation. But also, when I do that, I think, OK, well, I don't actually have the mass. So I need another equation that allows me to work out mass. So I then look at the other information I have in the question, so density and volume, and think, OK, do I know an equation that links those things? And you should. Density is mass divided by volume. So then we can rearrange that to give me mass. But I can then work out before putting it into my equation to enable me to work out the energy. So mass is going to be the density of water, which is a thousand, times the volume of water that is going to melt, which is 254. So that is my total mass that is going to melt. All I then have to do is times that by the latent heat in order to give me the energy. So 254,000 times 336,000 gives me total energy of, oh, that's a big number, uh, let's put some commas in, so, so uh, 85 billion, 334 million volts, right, uh, or 5.8, another way I could write that, would be 5.8, uh, sorry, 8, 5.8, 8.5 times 10 to the 10, okay, so you count 1, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that's how many spaces we've got to move the eight, and so it's ten to the ten. So ten to the ten joules. So eight point eight four eight point five four times ten to the ten joules. So you, they could ask like that for you to give your answer in standard form. Okay, here are just a couple of other ones. Feel free to pause the video and have a go at these first before I put the answers up. Okay, here's the first answer, so that's what you should have written first. Step number one, write down what the question tells you. Step number two, put the numbers in, and your answer should be 1,306 kilojoules, or 1,306,500 joules. And the second question, there is your answer. Here is some more. Again, feel free to pause the video and have a go at these, and then you can check whether you're right. Second question. If you got all of these right, wonderful, you've cracked latent heat. But if not, make sure you follow this step as always. Write down what the question tells you, write down the equation, put the numbers in, rearrange it if you need to, and then work out your answer and don't forget the units.